Barbara, great to see you today. First of all, thank you for inviting us to your home to uh, talk about a very special concert that took place last night. And maybe we'll have a, a bit of a chat about some of your previous albums. And you've got a new album coming up as well, haven't you? I have indeed, yes. It's coming out in the new year, but I'm awfully glad to have got last night over. It was a big <laughs> night for me. I mean, the concert last night, it was filmed for your... I suppose it's your debut DVD. I know people are going to say, oh, I've got a Barbara Dixon DVD, but that was really just a reissue of an earlier video performance, wasn't it? That's right. And I think it was... I was, trying to, I was trying to think about this. I'm glad you've just yeah. given me the date. I'm useless the with Albert dates. The Albert Hall. And it was at the Albert mm -hmm. Hall, and it was 1987. I kept thinking it was 1986, and then last night when I was coming home from Spool Spoolsby, I thought, couldn't be 1986, because I had my first son then, and I would have had a great big bump. <laughs> So it was 1987, the bump had arrived by right. then. And you're absolutely right, it was a video directed by Mike Mansfield. Right. But um, when I was with my, my previous management, um, I was always saying to them, we should do a DVD. Because mm. for me, it, it, the people who eventually buy the DVD will hear me saying, if it's still there and not on the cutting room floor, that in the 20 years since that video was recorded at the Albert Hall, I have changed hugely. Mm -hmm. My repertoire has changed. I've gone completely away from the mainstream of pop music, which I was still in then. And I've got all these fantastic songs that have now been captured for p posterity last yeah. night. So this DVD is not just me saying, hey, I've got a new DVD out. There's 20 years of a, a back, you know, looking up, back, yes, exactly. Yeah. It okay. is a catch up. Why did it take 20 years? That's the obvious question. Because artists like yourself, I mean, I suppose there are some people who probably lost track of you after January, February in your pop career. Um, the thing I like more recently about your albums is that, and one of the, the albums is so aptly titled Full Circle, is that you kind of come round again to what you were doing before the pop world cottoned on to you. Well, you're absolutely right. And I'm glad, as, as we say, uh, Troy and I are always saying, he gets it. <laughs> and actually, you've got it, which is okay. that <clears throat> I started singing when I was a schoolgirl. Mm -hmm. And I started singing folk music when I was a teenager. I was 27 when I went to do John, Paul, George, Ringo and Bert in Liverpool. So there was 10 years of me singing folk music. This is just like a potted history. Yeah. Then I became a pop star shortly afterwards. I was only a pop star for 10 <laughs> years of that time. Be really between 1975 and 1985, I was a pop star. Yeah. Since 1985, I've not been a pop star. I've worked in the theatre, I've sung, I've never sung extremes of music, but I've done, since 1985, mature music, songs, um, you know, theatre songs, Brecht and, um, you know, sophisticated stuff like Sondheim, adult music, and peppered throughout that has been traditional music mm -hmm. and serious, thoughtful music. Yeah. However, people still have a photograph of me on top of the pops with curly hair singing January, February. There's nothing I can do about that. No. Now, it's, it's not like confessing to be a member of the SS formally. <laughs> you know, so it's, I, I don't have to cover it up, no. but it does irritate me that people say, aren't you the person who sang January, February? I have to say, Yes, it's true. But, but as, as you just alluded to in your, in, in your preamble, it's a very small part mm -hmm. of what I did, but it was such a high-profile part. I think it must be like somebody who's been in Star Wars but then goes to the <laughs> RSC. Yeah. And people just say, please, can you, you know... Tell us that line you did when you were a robot in Star Wars, you know, and you must think, shut up, shut up. I, I suppose ultimately, though, because television is this all-seeing, all-doing medium, and people see you on things like The Two Ronnies and Top of the Pops, and bearing in mind when those shows were running, TV audiences were massive, and that's kind of maybe stayed in their minds. But the pop thing, I mean, some people get sucked into the pop thing and then spat out 10 years later like you could have been. 
and that's it, your career's over. Yeah, but you had the career that you had before that, you're talking albums, Morning Comes Quickly, and um, Answer Me. There, were, there was the, the, some pretty classy material on there anyway. The pinnacle of your pop stardom would have been January, February, but that really, if anything, is probably a one-off. It is interesting, um, yet on that album, the, the album which has January, February on it, which was very high profile pop material, there's about five songs written by me on that album. Yes. So although Alan Tarney produced the album and it was very enjoyable to work with Alan Tarney, I had a profile at that time as a songwriter as well. Um, as a singer of that material and I'm not sneering at the success I had no, in any way no, of and not. I love it but it's when people say to me why don't you sing tracks from something 27 years ago or something and I think I am not in the nostalgia business no now that that I have to clarify that and say and uh, that answer me another suitcase in another hall mm -hmm. caravans and I know him so well are very, very important milestones yes. in my career, regardless of what that career is about now. Mm -hmm. They are important. And I would never willfully throw out material um, that, that was so close to the hearts of people. Yeah. There are people in my audiences who would say to me, we met the first time we went out together and they're celebrating the 30th wedding anniversary yeah. or something. They say, we met and when we, 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 we heard Caravans on the radio or Another Suitcase was a song, or we came to see you in concert and you sang that we've never forgotten it. That's part of people's lives. It's mm -hmm. part of my life. And I would never run no. away from that. But I always say to people, I was actually rather pleased to see that someone like Bob Dylan said something similar recently, but I'm not putting myself in the same league as him. Mm. But I am not in the nostalgia business. No. I never look back. I, th I think what it is, um, it, th that particular era, if you like, forms part of the picture. Yes. But it doesn't yes. define you no. as an artist. No, it's and not. And sometimes people mistake that as being, well, that's what she does. And yet, really, if they saw the bigger picture, yes, it's just merely a small part of it. It is a small part of it. And I'm sure that someone like Nigel Kennedy has got it like 500% worse than me, yeah. which is that people would expect Nigel Kennedy to be turning up, you know, in his leathers because he was <laughs> foolish enough to do that at one point in his life. Yeah. But it, you cannot take away from Nigel Kennedy. No. He's a very yeah. good player. He is. He He's is. a fantastic player. And, you know, so the fact that, that he, you know, he was lightweight for a while, mm. that's okay. I mean, the reason I also, I'm not apologising again, but I didn't go for stardom, you know, I don't like stardom. Anyone who knows anything about me mm -hmm. will say she runs a mile from the trappings of success. You won't see me hanging out at premieres and stuff. Uh, I, if I had a choice, I wouldn't do that. I don't like it. I don't no. like um, sort of rubbing shoulders with celebrities. And nowadays what passes for celebrity yeah. is positively yeah, hideous. It is. And I don't want to, if someone calls me a celebrity, I take that <laughs> as an, a personal insult yeah. because I just can't bear it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I, I have done such a variety of work from um, the interesting thing for me is what was the transition in my earliest life when I was 17 or 16 from being a Beatles fan who'd loved the mm -hmm. Everly Brothers to going absolutely full throttle towards the arms of traditional music. That is the, the thing that it, yeah. it is. It's what I say to Troy, what is that that does that? And Troy and I have talked about this. And he said to me, he calls it the Unseen Stream, which is a, a, an album title of his. That's right. And it is, it is the thing in you that makes you respond to a certain type of music. It might be listening to Jerusalem in the Albert Hall. Mm -hmm. It can be, it could be listening to Miles Davis's solos. Yes. It could be listening to Marla. Yeah. It could be listening to George Formby. It doesn't matter what it is. But there's something in most people that touches a chord in yeah. them. And with me, it's, it's uh, traditional music. It's basically music of the British Isles. It's the, the, the mm -hmm. Western fringes 
the the Celtic music, the stuff with the drones, the stuff with the big hell notes, the 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 middles taken out of the chords. As soon as I hear that, my 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 heart turns over, right. and it and it is like it it's the best way to describe it. It is utterly through me like like Blackpool is on the stick of okay. rock. It's just there. Your two recent albums, which, uh, well, your new one, which is, is due to be released shortly, which is Time, Time and Tide, Tide, and Full Circle, have both been produced by Troy Donnelly. Um, and whilst there's a very, very strong traditional element running through those albums, they are still incredibly commercially well-crafted albums. So if, if there are people who are sometimes put off by the, the, the tag, you like, traditional. They think, oh... And I spoke with Troy about this last night, and some, to some people it's still Aaron Sweater's fingers in the ear and twigs in your real yes, ale. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I quite like that myself. Yes. But at the same time, traditional music covers so many other little sub-genres and little avenues you can yeah. go down. Yeah. And I think sometimes people miss out on that yeah. by dismissing traditional music yeah. because there are people who would listen to your um, Full Circle album and go, mm. that's not a traditional album. But there are other people who go, well, actually it is. In the sense that I can see where she's drawn from that and what how we've arrived yes. here. Yes. So I, I think sometimes that people judge a book by its cover when they should just maybe open the book and read a little. Well, there is a degree of that. I mean, I know that the you know there's a there's a very very tiny dyed in the wool traditional element mm -hmm. it, within traditional music, which is very I think very uh, very. There's a sort of fascist element in it, you know. They well, it's very not, insular. They do not tolerate yeah. anything that doesn't seem to go into their sphere of reference. Mm -hmm. But um, yet, they're, you know, the wonderful Mike Harding, who kind of embodies folk music in Britain because of his profile on the radio. Yeah. He has a most wonderful Catholic oh, he's taste very in music. Open-minded, though, Mike, Utterly, isn't he? yeah, and he likes you know, this, and he'll play Seth Lakeman, and say, if <laughs> Seth Lakeman becomes. A, a, a pop star, all the you, you know, all the, the mm -hmm. better for for Seth, but but nevertheless, the thing that I, I that always escapes me with the people who are very dyed in the wool about what traditional music is, is that they miss the point. Someone like Martin Carthy, who is the the god of yeah. uh, people who like traditional music in England, um, I'm I'm qualifying that because he is deeply English. Martin mm -hmm. um, is fantastically original. Well, Paul Simon rates him. He's, a, he's original. <laughs> he's original. Yeah. He is the Martin Carthy who was a young, vibrant musician who decided to arrange and play the songs in that way yeah. and play the guitar. He doesn't put his guitar down and, because it's not traditional. I mean, there was a very big kind of, you know, rather pole-faced attitude to traditional music. Uh, in the 1960s when I first got involved in it. And I just say, rubbish. It's, that's mm. all rubbish. I mean, music is to be enjoyed, whether it's Morris Men yeah, playing absolutely. on Whit Sunday yeah. or whether it's um, the, the, the you know, moving hearts, Donal Lunny, what he mm -hmm. did. Um, the, you know, in Ireland, it's really m metamorphosed into yeah. God knows what now. And in Scotland, you get, you know, people like Phil Cunningham doing wonderful work. Yeah. So all over the place, the music has evolved and it's very good that it's evolved. But there is still a place for the vintage approach like the Copper family and um, the, the way Waters and Carthy approach music. Yet they have originality. I love Waters and Carthy. Yeah, but I wouldn't. It's not poor faced. It's no. joyful. Well, yeah, the, being poor faced is the complete opposite of what it's meant to be. Exactly. Which is, There's a joy when you yeah. see when you see uh, um, uh, Norma with her <laughs> triangle yeah. giving it loads. Yeah. I just love it. It is. It's it's wonderful music, and and I always like you feel sad when people say. Oh, I don't like folk music. Oh my God, I don't like folk music. Yeah. And they, it's like people say, I hate country and western. Well, they should be forced to listen to Vince Gill, and then yes. it would change their mind forever. Or Hank Williams. Oh yeah, well yes, yeah, if you could go back a while. <laughs> yeah. But then modern artists doing yeah. singing, playing utterly beautifully. The set list for the DVD for the uh, the performance last night was a wonderfully eclectic show. So congratulations on that, because I know <laughs> picking a set list can sometimes be as difficult as performing one. Yes. Uh, and last night, I think you got it 
absolutely right. I liked the opening last night in the bleak midwinter into Here Comes the Sun, which of course I remember from John Paul George, Ringo and Burr's. But the song that, has, I mean, it's still resonating in my head now, Corpus Christi Carol, which is just, ah. I mean, that, that for me was a highlight. The whole gig was great, but I'm still got that tune in my head and I'll be, I'll be on the train and that'll still be in my head. Um, and I think a lot of people can draw from that. I mean, because that that's not just a piece of music. That touches somebody's soul. I know that sounds probably very pretentious. And I think it's supposed to touch your soul. Sorry for interrupting you, but no. I want it to touch your soul. Well, it did. Because it <laughs> must touch your soul because so much of what we have today does not touch your soul. It doesn't even You're not even allowed to mention your soul these yeah. days in case people get offended. So I think that your soul being touched by anything that we do, I'm not, I don't think that is pretentious of you to say okay. that. Because I'm, I'm very pleased that it works for you. Because again, when Troy and I, when we were working on Full Circle, we desperately wanted to make wonderful music that, that is, a, it really draws on what I said about the West Coast, this, uh, yeah. this Western British tradition of um, the scales, the notes, the, the, the weather, the air, the, you know, everything that, that, that is that world is the world that um, I really feel most comfortable in. I am a romantic person. Um, I'm, I'm quite prosaic and practical, mm -hmm. but I have this huge romanticism when it comes to art and music and a anything at all, buildings. Yeah. Um, I, I really see the soul in that. And then I suddenly, Troy and I, after having known each other for since 1994, we met each other, but we hadn't worked together all the time. Mm. And we'd never got close to making an album together. But I went to Troy for advice about whether he thought that I could make this kind of album. And he said, yes, you can. And I said, how can I do it? And he said, <laughs> we do it together. Yeah. You come and you and I will do this kind of album. He said, because I think I know what you are talking about. Mm. We understand each other perfectly, and he has uh, making records now is much more of a cottage industry. Yes. So it's a re it's really a, a massive commitment to make an album, but we are just completing the the second one. By the people time people see our interview, yeah. it will be out. What I, I, I can tell, that obviously there's, a, there's a great amount of romantic feelings in you because of the, some of the material that you, you cover and some of the material that you write yourself. Um, obviously, there's, there's some classical elements in there, which I have to mention, uh, Rafe Vaughan Williams, Henry Purcell, yes. who, again, are known as romantics in yes. the classical world. Yes. I mean, what was, it, was that what it was that attracted you to those particular composers? Well, I've always wanted to sing um, uh, When I Am Laid in Earth mm -hmm. for years and years yeah. and years. I once r did it as a piece um, when uh, I first went to London and uh, I, used to, uh, I used to go to a singing teacher in London. Just It was really to um, increase my... It wasn't to change my voice in any. It was just to increase my, uh, my, my stamina. Mm -hmm. You know, it's quite yeah. useful actually okay. to, you know, just for anybody watching this, yeah. just to, you know, if they want to sing and they run out of puff or they run out of voice and they need to sing a lot, it's good to get a few little systems in place to help yourself. So I went to this woman called Betty Rowe. Funnily enough, I met Jim Broadbent there for the first time, <laughs> but he used to go to her as well. I think he was going up for a musical and he said he didn't get the part, <laughs> but it was very funny. But, but Betty Rowe gave me this, this song because she thought I, I would sing it really well. And I'd known it for years, but finally recorded it with Troy. But the Ray Fawn Williams, I had a child in a concert singing it at my yeah. children's prep school here in Lincolnshire. And it was just a little girl of 12 singing it with a piano accompaniment. And I went, 
I love that song. Yes, I didn't realise that. <laughs> that the text was but from Verlaine and yeah. it had been trans uh, translated by Mabel Dearmer. And of course, Percy Dearmer worked with uh, Rafe Vaughan Williams on the hymn yeah. book. So mm -hmm. presumably that's how he knew yeah. the, uh, his wife, Mabel. But oh, that, the words and the ebb and flow of it and, and the piano accompaniment, it's just, it's perfection in uh, classical music. It's not mm. even like classics. It's a real yeah. proper song, isn't it? It is. And, and, and I think uh, the way that it's weird because you can just you can deconstruct songs as much as you like and you can still be none the wiser having done it. And you be, some things just work well oh, together. Oh, so beautiful. And that's it, you know. And the space in it, there's loads of space. And you can hear the singer breathing, and I, I just love it. And I, I love the idea that the you know the man in prison, because you know it's about yeah. him being in yeah. jail. So he listens the tree above the roof, and the, the bird, the bell drowsily rings, <laughs> and the bird singing, and him imagining the world outside the prison. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. I mean, it's just touching. So those songs, those classical songs, I wasn't saying. Okay, let's impress everybody. Let's do, let's do, you know, the Kefaro or something. Yeah. Let, let's do that. Yeah. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to do songs which a will be part of uh, what Troy and I would call our world. That mm. is this. All the other songs, everything on full circle, w hangs together as part of the whole. Yes. And the, you've you've noticed that the classical yeah. songs. There's um, there's uh, the faithless love. There's two contemporary songs in there. Yeah. And there's the epic Corpus Christi Carol and the Eriske love song, and those kind of big uh, traditional things are in, uh, nestling in amongst this other stuff. And you don't pick um, faithless love out and say. That's a load of rubbish because it's not as important as <laughs> Sky Above the Roof. Let's get rid of that. It worked. They all That's work together. Song, and Time and Tide mm. is a more, I would say, slightly more self-confident version okay. of Full Circle. It started off as Full Circle 2. That was the working title, yes, wasn't it? So. Yes, Full Circle 2, we called it <laughs> until about two months ago. Yeah. We just love working together. And we've got... Um, more tradition. It's more of the same, really. Yeah. You know, we're doing it. We've done a version of "Going Back," which is a song I have had in what I call my shirt box. I've had that for. Yeah. Um, I've had that in there for thirty years. I've always wanted to do "Going Back," and I've never done it. <laughs> and uh, the uh, Alan Clyde, who runs my website, last night said to me, "Oh, the Dusty Springfield song," and I said, "Well." It's not a Dusty Springfield song Goffin to me. And King. It's Goffin yeah. and King, but I know it from the birds. Well, I know the birds' version as well. It's not that Dusty's version isn't great, because it is great, but it's a wonderful song. It is a lovely song. I mean, it's a pop song, but yeah. it's a great pop song, and, and it's, it is rather sad. And I think it's also quite sad to sing it when you're older. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah, because it's a, it, the, the, it's a bittersweet song. It has reflection yeah. in it. And that's, I looked at the lyric and thought, really great, because I was saying to the band when we were up at Water re re rehearsing, I said to them, uh, you know something, for me, it's, a, it's an interesting thing when I pick up a song. I, I, I mean, very often I've tried to, uh, I've contemplated singing songs over the years by various people and I've got the lyric and the top line uh, sorted out and I've yeah. been sent, sent the stuff by the publisher and I've looked at the lyrics and said, can't do that, it's rubbish. Yeah. The tune's been good and it's had a good arrangement on the original and I've decided yeah. to cover it and it's, I, I just thought it's rubbish. So all, the, all of the lyrics um, that I've ever sung, I mean, I suppose including January, February, which is the least uh, lyrically uh, sophisticated of anything I've ever sung, probably. You know, it's, it, it, it is, still has a, it has a degree of depth to it. You, you seem, uh, as you, you come across to me, as being very attracted to, if you like, singer-songwriters, but the songs are very important for you. I mean, you covered songs by Dylan. Jerry Rafferty is another favourite. He's a favourite of mine as well. Um, and people like that, I mean, is it an instant thing for you when you do hear a song? You hear a song and think, oh, I've got, 
I love that song. I'd love to cover that. Well, I used to do this all the time because I used to, because I had so much pressure put on me by record companies to do covers on my albums. Mm. They always wanted me to cover things and um, they were, because I don't know, that maybe they thought that familiarity, it's, it's just pathetic, isn't it, really? Well, I suppose you, your first yeah. hit for a lot of people was a cover. Yeah, th me, and they so. say, but I, mean, I don't even think it was quite as intelligent as that. <laughs> I think they thought, oh, we'll, we'll get her to do stuff that, that people know already. And so it'll get played on the radio because people. That still think, happens now, though. Yeah, double a double whammy. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it depends on the covers. So the reason I got mm. interested in cover versions was purely because if I got there first, they'd have to do what I selected because I've never done songs. There was only mm. one song I was ever persuaded to do that I didn't want to do, and everybody said you've got to do this. It'll be great. And actually, I can't even remember what it's called. It was on a a live album I did, but it was the one studio track in the early 80s. And it was it was rubbish and I should mm. never have done it. I didn't like it. But as far as cover versions are concerned, I've done all sorts of things and some more successful than others. Um, and I always gravitated towards the things which meant something, which had some kind of message. And there would be loads of people out there saying, for goodness sake, what's she doing covering that? I mean, it could never be bettered. I also stopped, drew the line sometimes as well for that reason. Mm. Somebody would say, you know something, you should do that. And I would say, you're wrong. And they would say, why? And I would say, it cannot be bettered. Yeah. It cannot how, be bettered. How then, how then, if I can be devil's advocate here, yeah. do you approach a Dylan song? Because... Mm. Don't think twice. I mean, the, the, there are people who probably don't even think that's a Dylan song. Yeah. But I know someone who, who didn't think it was a Dylan song. So, I mean, something like that. The times they are changing, very, very well known. And I suppose don't think twice. If you're a Dylan fan, you know anything about music, you probably know it as well. But there are people out there who probably don't know that's a Bob Dylan song. Well, I had an album of Dylan material which came out in 1992. Mm -hmm. And my, the way I approached the project was I thought... Um, it would be a good thing to do. I thought people who liked me probably wouldn't like Bob Dylan singing. Mm -hmm. And people who liked Bob Dylan might like to hear somebody else doing the songs. Yeah. Now, I don't think the Died in the Wool early Dylan fans who would have liked his original versions on freewheeling and all that stuff, yeah. they wouldn't particularly go for what Ian Lynn and I did no. with that album because... You talk in 1992 here, so that it was quite a big production. There's a lot of electronic stuff in there. Now I'm sure that if Ian was sitting in the room, he would say, if I was doing it in 2007, I would make it much more organic than it was. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, it is what it is. And, and there was a lot of heart and soul went into it. It mm -hmm. was very seriously approached and the songs were very carefully chosen. But I... I'm an enormous fan of Dylan's early material. Yeah. Now, I can't exactly tell you why, whether it's because I was there yeah. and it meant more to me or whether the songs are, in fact, better songs. But all I can say is those songs, the, most of the songs that I did on the album are fairly important, apart from when I paint my masterpiece and... Um, and there was, you know, there were one or two others that were kind of lightweight, but I really liked mm. a lot. But I think Dylan is a genius. There is no doubt about it. And I don't think it's sacrilege to re-record music by someone that you think is a genius. No, no, absolutely I don't not. think at all. No. I mean, I think if you're trying to copy them or you're trying to in some way no, no ingratiate point. yourself... No point. Defeats I don't think there's the any point at all. But if you do think... I love this material and I can work with it. And in mm -hmm. fact, Rab Noakes told me that there was a little snippet of one of my recordings on a recent film about Dylan. Nice. They used a, a piece of, a little piece of my, of my album. Well, that's and, acceptance then, isn't and it? And I think Dylan <laughs> heard it as well. I think yeah. Dylan was sent a copy by um, Columbia who, who, who yeah. did that album. You did a wonderful version of The Times That Are Changing last night. And, and Nick Holland, I have to say... Bless him. He's got such Sang a sexy voice, hasn't he? And, and it's big shoes to fill because on the album, Jerry Rafferty sang that with you. And they're pretty big shoes to fill. 
Jerry did a wonderful uh, vocal for us, and Ian Lynn, uh, again, who produced that album, he, um, Ian arranged the song in such a way that it would appeal to Jerry, and it would really mm. make Jerry sound wonderful. He almost did it like a Jerry Rafferty song. Yes. And we, and we, we, we had a funny, we, we tell a funny story that in the middle, over the instrumental part, Nick, um, uh, when Troy is playing the guitar solo, and we, uh, the three of us are saying, ooh, 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 ooh yeah. which is a real Rafferty signature. Yeah. Ooh, because he was always doing those yeah, oohs in little yeah. banks. Mm. So Pete and I, the three of us were doing these oohs, but when we did them on the recording, we wanted Jerry to sing them. <laughs> so we got Jerry in the studio and he did his bit. And, and we said, just before we go, Jerry, will you sing the oohs for us? And he said, so what do you want me to do? So we got him in the studio. He took ages to do them. <laughs> he didn't recognise the homage <laughs> that was in there. We had written a Jerry Rafferty little section yeah. for him to sing. And he didn't and notice he, it. He just does it automatically <laughs> I guess. in everything he ever does. But he, he, you know, it took him ages to do it because, it because he hadn't sort of dreamed it up. You, you've covered Jerry Rafferty a couple of times. I've done you? the you Royal do... Mile, I did City to City. I loved City to City uh, when I heard that. That, that was a single as well. That should have been a big hit. Oh, it was great. It was uh, your first album for CBS, that's if I remember right. right. That's City to City. And that right. should have been a big hit, yeah. sadly. I loved it. And I did, um, I did two train songs at that time. I did <laughs> the City of New Orleans as well. And, oh, the uh, 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 Steve Goodman song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to do two songs about trains. And city to city, and uh, I've done. I did the Royal Mile as well. I've done loads of Jerry, Jerry, um, over my head. I've done. You're doing uh, one on the current tour as well, I believe. Or you did one last night on, uh, the, the, on the yeah, DVD. the right moment, which was yeah, the title which is track. a lovely song. I mean, do you think? I mean, the thing I can't understand is I mean, he had his little, if you like. Everybody thinks, oh, Baker Street or Stuck in the Middle, mm. but I think he's wildly underrated. He's, well, he, he hasn't done a lot of getting out there and sort of playing to people. Mm. So I think there are great Jerry Rafferty aficionados out there yeah. who know all about him and hang on his every word. But he doesn't come up these days with that much work. No. So I think a lot of people are slightly having to hang on to his past uh, repertoire. But even with the older songs, they seem to pick the same songs all the time. Yes, it's always yes, stuck in the middle, yes. or it's always Baker Street yes, or Night Owl, and yes. I'm going, oh no, there's way, way more. Oh, so that. Yeah. Further back, I mean, one of my favourite albums by him was Can I Have My Money Back? It's yeah. a beautiful track on there, which I'm, actually I'm surprised that, that, that more people haven't done it. Mary Skeffington, which is a Mary, beautiful Ma song. And Rab sang, Rab yeah. was on Mary Skeffington yeah. too. Do you remember a song called What's Ever, Whatever's Written in your heart is yes, all I that do. matters. Yes. That was on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was on, and uh, I did backing vocals for a couple or three of, of um, Jerry's albums mm. um, when he needed another singer. Um, and whatever is written in your heart, I, I sang on that. And um, when I saw Jerry last, he said to me that James Taylor had written him a letter. <laughs> It, it, years after that album came out, like 20 years afterwards, yeah. to say, Dear Jerry Rafferty, I really love that song. Well, I'd have that framed <laughs> in my living room, in fact, over the fireplace. Isn't that great? And I said, you got a letter from Well, of course, James yeah. Taylor is my, is my hero. Again, another song I'd from, by James Taylor. You did yeah. that at Millwork. Isn't that a great song? Well, I, do you know, I, that was strange because I came to that song, I, I'm very remiss of me, but I came to that song via Bette Midler, of all people. Who, I, Bette Midler did a great version of it in the 70s. I've never heard that. Oh, it's wonderful. I mean, she used to do it in a live set and she tore the place apart with it. I mean, you know, you'd have people literally crying. Yeah. But it's a great song. Yep. And the great thing is, of course, James Taylor is still playing as well as ever. And James know. Taylor is, is, if anything, in my opinion, much better. When I listen to his early songs... Not the songs, but his early performances now. Mm. I think, well, I'm not putting myself in the same class as James Taylor, but actually I'm much better now than I used to be. I think I sound better now. I've got much more richness now. Mm. James Taylor is a better singer now than he was when he you was 25. You know what 25. that is? That's life. Yes. And it is life and it's experience <laughs> and soul and all sorts of stuff. Plus his voice has broadened out. Yeah. And he's just... 
superlative. I mean, he's an inspiration to me actually mm -hmm. because I just think he never looks back. He does he he, he does sing uh, Fire and Rain and Sweet Baby James in his concerts. Why wouldn't he? They're fantastic. There's songs. So many James Taylor songs to choose. Yeah. Though, what was it about Millworker that sort of attracted you? Well, I think what happened was I heard. Uh, a live set that he did. He went out when Don Grolnick was still alive. They went round yeah. the States and they did a massive tour. Mm. He hadn't done a lot of live work, I don't think, for a while. Mm -hmm. And he went out and he did, he really got back into playing live again and started to enjoy mm -hmm. it. And then they did this massive tour and they recorded certain nights on the tour. And the wonderful band were there um, and he was, he was just so good. And one of the songs was Millworker. He kind of revamped it from yeah. the way he did it before. And it had much more, it was really steady pace. And it, I just loved, I loved it, I identified it with it because I actually like, I quite like political songs in a way. Yeah. I do like political songs. And that's my old unreconstructed folk singing <laughs> mid 60s yeah. coming out. I mean, I can still, you know, wear diamond earrings, but sing political songs. You know, it's okay. the way, it's the sort that, of way I am. That's coming from the Ewan McCall school. Yeah, that, it? well, <laughs> Ewan McCall would go, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But n nevertheless, uh, it, is, it is interesting to say mm. that, that um, I'm not a poli political person, really. Um, I'm certainly not an activist in any way, but I do, uh, I do, I, I love that song. I love that it's line one of those, about... I think it's one of those things where you say, oh, I can get my head around that. And, and yes, exactly. And I love the line about, you know, she, she, she'll work in the mills because she's paid and she needs to work and she'll never meet the boss. Yeah. But, you know, it's okay. I think actually so there's probably lots of people been there in that Absolutely. situation. Absolutely. Yes, and there's still a lot of people now. <laughs> I guess there so are. So there is. It is, it is the, it's the voice of the small person, yeah. really. The, the, a small voice. I agree. And, yeah. and, and that, uh, I, I love that. I, I love it. I remember when I did it in uh, Seven Ages of Women, when I did it in the theatre, mm -hmm. my director gave me a shirt and a pair of gloves, like working gloves, to hold. That's all I did. But for the <laughs> audience, it transferred... Trans I hear it's, it's, if you like, it's very symbolic. It was symbolic, and yeah. that's why he's a clever director, Chris Bond, and, and he mm. directed me in Blood Brothers. But he just gave me a working shirt and a pair of gloves. So when I sang those words, it, it you know, I sometimes was Sometimes, though, you see, uh, less is more sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've, you've mentioned Blood Brothers. I mean, Willie Russell is, must be surely a very important part of your life. John Paul George, Ringo and Burr's Blood Brothers. Um, I have to say, the version of Easy Terms last night was lump in the throat time. Um, and coming from Merseyside, as I do, obviously that play ha strikes a note with me. Although I'm not obviously of that generation, I can remember my nan and, and her sisters mm. were of that generation. Um, and it's a wonderful song. I mean... Again, I mean, parts like that come along very, very rarely, and yet you, you weren't too sure originally about playing that role, were you? Well, I couldn't act, basically. I, I'd never acted. I'd I never known that when I saw you do it. I wasn't, an, I I wasn't an actress, and, and um, I, it was very, I was very lucky because, actually, my mother's uh, a scouser, and, and uh, you know, there, there are a lot of women in that family. I've still got two cousins who uh, come from... Uh, just off Upper Parliament Street yeah. in, in Liverpool, so my my Liverpool pedigree is pretty good, you know. Mm. It's uh, well, all the women on my, in my family, going back, are very strong. That they breed, they breed yeah, them tough in Liverpool. That's right. Well, my my mother, my mother's mother, my Granny Mally, um, latterly, she lived in Carrington Street, just off Upper Parliament Street, yeah, and my it was my my auntie Ivy's house, and the, my two cousins Ivy and Sylvia brought up there we used to visit in the in the in the summer so the environment of the johnson family in at, at the beginning when yeah. mrs johnson's husband leaves her and the twins are born and all that it's it's quite it's quite interesting actually for me because it was rather like carrington street 
and the neighbours, I remember, and I was coming <laughs> from a small town in Scotland, but I, I used to go so long, uh, so many times that, that I got used to the neighbours and the big Catholic families and, the, you know, there uh, were people of multi-colours in the, Liverpool. And the doors were first, always open. First time I ever saw a black face <laughs> was in Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and uh, Chinese people still, a lot of Chinese mm -hmm. people there. And so the, the huge kind of the smells, the, the smells of the city, uh, the, the, the walls, the gable ends where we used to play with the balls <laughs> against the walls and skipping and tar, bursting tar bubbles in the But you know street. why that is, though? Because Liverpool is a port. Yes, of so course. So that's why it's yeah. so cosmopolitan. And it was wonderfully cosmopolitan and yeah. I loved it. So actually, I bring a lot of life to Mrs Johnson uh -huh. because I, when Willie said... Do you, would you want to have a bash at this? Do you want to do it? <laughs> um, having sung, you see, I sang Easy Terms for him on a demo, and so he, he you know, he, he was sold. He yeah. wanted me, he loved what I did with it. He loved yeah. the sound, and he thought, <laughs> anyway, so I did decide to do it. I was so frightened. I was hanging on by a thread to my sanity. Uh, Chris Bond is the most wonderful director, and he just sat there and sat me down, and he said, you can do this. Mm -hmm. I will help you, but you can do this. And we went through the script and we did it. And eventually I stepped out the 4th of January or whatever it was, 1983. Once I had a husband and I was away. And I, the first time I got a laugh, I couldn't believe it because I'd never had a laugh before. I'd, people didn't laugh at my singing, thankfully. No. And I got this laugh and I went, Oh my God, that's a laugh. Okay, right. Wait till it subsides, then speak in. <laughs> so I had to learn all this. I worked with a great actor in the space, in, in the shape of uh, George Costigan, yeah. who played Mickey. Mm. He I used to hang on to him for support and love and all sorts of things. And, and I met my husband, Oliver. He was the stage manager. So it was a very wonderful, momentous, volcanic time, really. And I won the Best Actress in the Musical from the... Olivier Awards, they were called the Society of West End Theatres then. Mm. And I could not believe it. I was sitting in the audience with Willie. Yeah. But Willie, of course, the reason that Willie looms large in my life is that Willie came from folk music. Yes. He indeed. was yeah, very involved in folk music, and yeah. that's how I know him. And I met him in Edinburgh when he'd come up to do something at the Edinburgh Festival. And... Um, I used to stay with him and Anne in Liverpool and I went there. So I knew him a long, long time. When he did John Paul George, he asked me to do that. Um, he was unknown then, virtually, apart yeah. from in Liverpool. John Paul George Ringo and Bert was the first. He won the Evening Standard Award for that mm -hmm. in London. And then, of course, in the interim, he'd done Charlie Valentine and all sorts of stuff. He's a uh, yeah. big star. But uh, Blood Brothers... So wonderful. And critically, it did very well, but commercially, initially, it wasn't a big success. It's kind of grown over the last 24, nearly 25 years now. It Maybe is. 25 years, wasn't it? In it is extraordinary what you say, and I've never been able to figure that out. It was a wonderful production, the original production. It was so fantastic. The band was wonderful. I've, that somebody has just made a DVD out of an ancient old video recording of a dress rehearsal, oh, so which nice. Willie sent to me, and I, <laughs> I saw, I've got it. It's very poor uh, quality, mm. but, but Oliver and I were able to watch it because, of course, yeah. we worked on it, and Obviously, therefore yeah. it's, it's very meaningful to us. And um, uh, all the original cast and everything, watching them again and, and watching myself doing the scenes I did and... Um, it, was, it was quite interesting, really very interesting. But to me, it is fantastic. It was very, very dark. It was. And think about very, it. very funny. Well, there was no happy ending either at the end of it, which is no. the, the very unusual. If you think musicals, it's all jazz hands. Yes, and, and, yeah. and the end of Blood Brothers, it wasn't. It was not a happy ending. Bill uh, Kenwright was very keen for me to, to kneel down and cross the hands of the twins after they were shot at the end when I've had to do Blood Brothers. And I refuse to do that because I don't see Mrs. Johnson as uh, crying, weeping tears. And, well, she's and not a victim. No, absolutely no. not. And I absolutely draw the line. Right. So I just stand there and 
I find it much much more powerful for me to do that. Yeah. Um, so that was in my original my original remit from Chris Bond, and I refused to move from it. But the the um, they've been very kind. The the, the Kenwright production that uh, ask me regularly to come and be Mrs. Johnson again. Mm -hmm. And I come in like a, a tornado and sort of shoot right through the middle of, of the way they do it and yeah. sort of speed it up. It doesn't last so long when I'm in it. And, um, and, and away I go again. I'd come into the empire or I'll maybe do it somewhere else for them. But um, I do believe now I'm probably the oldest Mrs. Johnson in the world. And I really think it's, it's, not, it's not so good. I mean, I, I, I love the original production so much. And... Critically, you're absolutely right. It didn't. It didn't uh, really work. It, it, the production worked, but um, a lot of people said they didn't want to watch a show with an unhappy ending yeah. that was all about Larry Scousers. <laughs> you know, they didn't want to see a show like that. Now it's become yeah. a cult sort of thing. Well, it's huge. I mean, it's not just confined it's, to England. Uh, it's gone on tour in America. And I'm thinking, good God, what do the Americans think oh of this? Oh, dear. Because you just think it's weird. Because um, when something... I've always thought that something like that, that takes a long time to kick in and yeah. be accepted... Once it is accepted, that's it. There's, you know, it's just taken as that it is successful, and it's yeah. always been successful. And don't, people don't realise that sometimes there's a yeah. real hard, long lead-in before and that success kicks in. I also have to say that things, theatre productions, do not improve with age. They're like pianos; they're best when they're new. Oh, if they're pianos. good when they're new, they should leave them. And then, at some point in the future. You know, they'll do them at the RSC with a small company and they'll be fantastic again. I have to say, though, having seen the original performance and the original cast with, with you in yeah. early 1983, and I saw it again about five years ago, and it still gets you. I have to be honest. And yeah. I thought, oh, God, this really is good. And the, 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 although it's not a happy ending, it's a very powerful it's, ending. Well, it, it has to be. It yeah. has to be powerful because of what it is. Because when I first saw that, I couldn't believe it. I thought that was yeah. a big shock. I really was. Yes. <gasps> oh, my but God. Because the prophecy you know. has to be fulfilled. Because in the first scene, how they were born and yes. they died on the self-same day, yeah. it has to come true. Yeah. Because, you know, that's the way that Willie constructed it. it was, it's a ballad format. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you kind of think of that as a little piece of your own, though? I mean, surely you must. Because, I mean, it, it was an amazing... Well, Mrs. Johnson... I I love Mrs. Johnson, and I, I have a, a, to to answer that question consummately. Was once when it started at the very beginning, through two or three days in, when it had got mm -hmm. fabulous reviews from everybody in Liverpool. I was talking to a man in Wales who was talking to me down the line. He hadn't seen the show, and I was in Radio Merseyside talking to him on his radio show, and he was talking about. You know, you've just opened in this new show in Liverpool, Blood Brothers. He said to me, what does it feel like playing a slut? He wouldn't have said that if he'd have been in Liverpool, would he? <laughs> he wouldn't have said that if he'd seen it. No. And I was not happy at all. And I, I was really, <laughs> really cross. And I said, Mrs. Johnson is not a slut. No. I said, she might not have any money, but she is a very respectable woman. Mm. I was really, really cross with him. And I still feel like that now. It really angers me to think, what an ignorant thing to say. And therefore, if you're asking me if I feel anything for Mrs. Johnson, I am Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> okay, she's, never been, she's never been taken away from me. No. She's well, still that's there. that's nice to hear. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the musical theatre side of things, obviously, that you're very well known for a number of pieces. Obviously, that is one of them. Uh, another Suitcase, Another Hall, uh, in Evita, which must have been great, again, at the time, Andrew Lloyd Webber and, and Tim Rice at the time really were at the peak. And I suppose, although that wasn't the first thing they'd done, that, I think that possibly was the best that they'd done. I think... Jesus Christ Superstar, Joseph, and Evita really was, for me, the pinnacle of their work. And I know they didn't do anything after that, really, did they? Um, no, 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 they didn't. I mean, it, they that went their was... separate ways after that. But, and I think they were wise to do that. 
I think it, I think it's true. I think they had different ideas of what musical theatre should be. Um, the, I was not, of course, involved in the stage show of no. Evita. I was only on the, the concept the album. album. But yeah. they'd already done this concept album idea with, with Jesus Christ Superstar, which had worked well for yes. them. So they really had... Um, they, they gave it a lot of thought. And eventually, originally, they thought, that I, they, they thought of me for Evita. Right. But I don't have the sort of voice that could have done that. And they asked Julie to do it. And then they said to me, well, we love you. Would you do this one song? Would you do the mistress's song? But Andrew made me sing in an unnatural key for my voice. It's much oh. too high for me. It's a shame because it's a great song. It, well, now it's become a great song mm. because of the way that we play it. Yeah. It's become much more interesting and, and it has much more to it. But I do like the song very yeah. much. Yeah. And I think it's happened to all the things that I do and my, my old songs. I mean, it's quite interesting that we just transformed I Know Him So Well quite recently. Well, I was going to mention you that. See, again, there's another there's the Tim Rice connection again there yeah. with chess. I mean, the sound with Benny and Bjorn from ABBA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the arrangement that you performed on the on the night last night at the performance yeah. you did for the DVD that is incredible, and and it's a really stripped down, um, I don't know, it's really like back to basics version. It's, it's not so a big lovely. production, yeah. but I, and Pete, bless him, what a wonderful! I I was like, wow, this is great. It is interesting, isn't it? What we've done with it now mm. that I said to to Troy is there anything we can do with I Know Him So Well because I'm bored with 80s power ballads. I can't be doing with it. I mean, they were all right in the 80s. Yeah, but yeah, now course, it's yeah. 2000 and, and uh, you know, mid-2007, two thousand and seven, eight. you know, so we just don't want to be m doing that. And I am not one for leaving songs alone. You know, I don't want to change them out of all proportion. Some people change the song so that, you know, a song but that you, you don't love, recognize it. You don't yeah, recognize it anymore. <laughs> and Or they rush through it and they put them all in a medley and it oh, lasts about like two that minutes. Either. Yeah. It's hideous yeah. and it, it doesn't show due deference to the material. I know him so well, it's a really good song. Uh, Benny Anderson is like a serious songwriter to me. I love Benny Anderson. Oh, uh, him and Bjorn, I think. Yeah. They're pop genius. And, I uh, yeah, and I Benny, Benny has serious, a lovely so. kind of gloomy, you know, Scandinavian... Uh, it's a very a lovely, classical, very European classical lovely. approach, It's got a kind of, you know, Sibelius, mm. Gustav Holst type of thing yeah. um, in his serious music as well, and his arrangements for chess, which were just superlative. Mm. But I know him so well, it's a really nice song, and it's much loved as well in, you know, in my, amongst my public. So I didn't want to muck around with it, but I said to Troy, could we do it? And he's done a sort of John Renborn arrangement of <laughs> I Know Him So Well, which, which is just, I went, wow, when I heard mm. it. You know, it's just great. And the boys, of course, have to sing really high. And it's, it's very difficult because, of course, it being an original female du duet. But we, I think we do it very well. And I think it's much more, it's much more tender. It's much more... Uh, I think people uh, will be surprised, but accessible. pleasantly surprised. Yes. Yes. Because you, the song is there. It's not that it's unrecognisable. Of course not. Everybody knows what it, it is. But it's a wonderful take on it. And I commented to Troy on the arrangement. And I just said, wow, that's a great arrangement of that it song. It is a wonderful arrangement. And I'm very, very happy with it. And also we evolved uh, Caravans was the same. Yeah. Because the Mike Bat um, uh, original version of Caravans was very, very straight with the London Symphony Orchestra. Caravans. It's a kitchen sink job, isn't it, really? <laughs> Da, da, da. And it was all very like a big orchestral arrangement. Mm. But the thing is, the undeniable truth about Caravans is it is a great song. It is. It is a great it song. It moves people. Stirring, Pe I think. It's people also it. it's sort of inspirational. It's a bit like a hymn. It is. People say to me, "Oh my God, I love it so much," and it is the favourite of all my hits. There's no doubt about it. I would mm. be lynched if I didn't sing Caravans in every show I ever did anywhere. I mean, ultimately, uh, you would have to rearrange that particular song because it was short of taking out the LSO with yeah. you every time yeah. you did it. And I wouldn't want to do it no. that way anyway. That was 1980 as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I said to Mike Batt, uh, we were emailing each other about something not that long ago, and I said to him, Caravans is the favourite song um, of my old repertoire. It's, it, it, and, you know, he said that was really nice to hear. Yeah. But, the, but you were talking about the repertoire and the DVD, and I just wanted to say to you that 
I gave it a huge amount of thought because because of the video which was done in 1987 with yeah. 20 years of material to mark on this DVD. I do want people to buy it. I want it to fly off the merchandising stand on my tour. Of course mm -hmm. I do. It's a commercial exercise as well. And I want people to look at it and say, wow, look at that. Those things are on it. That would be great. But... I would always have put another suitcase uh, and I would always have put I know him so well and I would have always put caravans and I would and and because of it being 20 years in the making since the last one I want mill worker I want the Dylan songs yeah um, I want um, the the full circle stuff um, and and the Donalogue, which was from Parcel of Rogues, and yes. see these are the albums I've made in that inter in that interim time. Uh, Love Hurts came from uh, Dark End of the Street, which was um, in the 1990s as well. And I wanted to allude to the history. I just wanted to tick off the little milestones throughout those 20 years. And I didn't want anybody coming up to me and saying, "Why didn't you sing a track from Dark End of the Street?" Why didn't you do that? Because it was like it would be like me saying, I don't like that album or I don't yeah. like those songs. So I did something and then I hit them with the three new tracks from Time and yeah. Tide as well because I want to be current. And I think that explains what you saw me play last night, explains my philosophy in a nutshell about the music I play. Mm. It was all there in do that you, show. Do you think then that? There are obviously going to be some people who may have lapsed over the years, but there are you've got a, obviously got a very hardcore and very closely knit fan base who will be a very much aware of what you've been doing over the last twenty years. But there are going to be, by, you know, there's always going to be people who maybe fall by the wayside and then come back. So for many, it, this serves two purposes. First of all, it's you, if you like, saying, "Look, this is how we're doing these songs. These are the songs that we've done over the last twenty years," and you're going to enjoy these versions. And also, for those who maybe lapsed a bit, it's a bit of a kind of catch-up for them. Well, look, this is what you've maybe missed, and here's where I'm going. Well, yes, I, I mean, I do hope that is the case. But actually, a lot of people do drop out of your life from uh, audiences, massive mm. audiences of 25 years ago. Yeah. They'll never come back yeah. because they, A, don't go to concerts probably at all. Mm -hmm. And they only came to concerts because they liked the current thing that that's was in right. the charts. Yeah, now, right. they're not, uh, with the greatest of respect to them, they're not music lovers. They're not that interested in, no. in, in, in one's career or, or music per se. They're interested in a photograph of somebody at the time, and they, they, they might be the same people, same people who go and see other artists. But the fans who come to see me now are people who have survived all that time. There are other people who have kind of got into me through a, a, just a snap decision that they've made in their lives. Yeah. Let's go and see her. I liked caravans, and they, they might they might be. Tw 15 years after Caravans, yeah. they've come to see a show. They've got hooked. They're still there. But there's the, these people, I'm sure if you spoke to the, the people sitting on the front row of my audience last night, oh, yeah. you might have got a person from each of those categories. <laughs> yeah. But what I do want to have is I do want to keep the people who've loved me for many, many years happy. But I also want to keep... Um, just abreast of the times as well. Yeah. I do want people to say, that's Barbara Dixon, that is what she does, and I don't want them to say, January, February is what I do. Absolutely not. Well, that is, that's a, a real problem. There's nothing wrong with January, February, but it was 27 years ago. I am not the woman with the curly hair who sang January, February, because I've worked constantly ever since. And also I say to the people, you know, sometimes I sit in a taxi in London and the taxi driver says, do you still work? And I just <laughs> burst out laughing because it's so funny. The reason he's saying that is I'm not a judge on X Factor. Yeah, you haven't been on the telly lately, I suppose, yeah. Mind you, it's better than saying, didn't you used to be poverty? Yes, and, and, also, <laughs> and also if you are on telly, what are you going to be on? Well, there's nothing. There's you know, really that, that's nothing the problem there now for it, artists of your kind. There's nothing um, there, is there? For people I suppose like me. ultimately that, that this is this DVD will be a beautiful little snapshot captured in time, 
and uh, it, it's there for everybody yeah. to watch. Yeah. And I think that you can't say fairer than that. It captures a moment. Well, I, I have lovely experiences with my audience because I sign at the end of my shows. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm interested in signing because I'm not just interested in selling merchandise. I'm interested in seeing the people who come and see me play. I want to see them and I want to, I want to meet them. And I, I remember, who was the guy who did... Um, do, da, 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 da. The guy who was the vocal performer who used to do tracks of vocals. Bobby McFerrin. Don't, Bobby McFerrin. Mm. Don't worry, be happy. Yeah. He used to come to the door, the door of the theatre <laughs> as the audience were coming out to thank them for coming. <laughs> right. Well, how good is that? Now, isn't that incredible? Well, right. I don't do that, but people who are interested yeah. in saying hello to me can wait behind. And I love it. I love it when it's life affirming for me when they say, mm. we love the water is wide. God, it's fantastic. Like the fans said last night on the front row, they were talking about that in particular and uh, how much they enjoyed the Witch of the West Marylands and the new things they'd never heard before. Mm. But I listen to the people and I listen to what they've got to say. I don't please them. No. Um, if they say, why didn't you sing Answer Me? I said to a man in Glasgow, I'm going to put that back in the set because you deserve to have answer me. So occasionally I'll yeah. take a note from somebody, but I don't really, I do what I want to do, but within the parameters of being sensible and doing stuff and, and being creative and the, moving on. The lovely thing about that is that basically these people are telling you that you have been a part yes, of their life yes. and, and, and an important part. They're telling me that they like what I'm yeah. doing. It is very, very uh, supportive. People yeah. say... We love you, we love what you're doing, we love the songs, continue to give us these songs and we will continue to play. Now that is like, that's a license to enjoy yourself, isn't it? Well, that's the artist audience trust thing. Yeah, and the lovely thing also is they come along, this man will come up and he'll say, my wife's too embarrassed to say hello, she's standing <laughs> over there, but I've come to tell you that it was fantastic and those other people standing with my wife have never seen you play before and mm. they think you're fantastic. People bring other people, yeah, they get of kind they of involved yeah. and they say, you'll love her and they'll say, the other ones will say, oh, I don't want to see her. She was the one who did January, February. <laughs> you know, there'll be a lot of that yeah, and suppose. they'll be dragged along and they'll be, their Blown life away. will be transformed yeah. momentarily. And that's what I always say about James Taylor. You watch James Taylor in concert, your life is transformed. Well, Barbara, I have to say, your music has been part of my life for a great many years. I don't want to make you feel old, but um, it's wonderful that you're out there still playing and performing. I think the DVD is going to excite a lot of people. And, of course, they will be able to buy it on your tour in, in February of next year. And I, for one, am going to be there and uh, wholeheartedly uh, want you to continue doing what you're doing. Thanks for talking to us today, Barbara. Thanks, John. Thank Pleasure. You.